Welcome to CBS News Primetime Interview. I'm John Dickerson. Usually you see me nightly from this desk, but from time to time we like to bring you the work I do on the road. My conversation for the next hour is with singer-songwriter Jason Isbell, who is marking a number of milestones past and present. The four-time Grammy Award winner is celebrating the 10-year anniversary of his breakout solo album, Southeastern. And recently, Jason made his feature film debut in Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. While on set, he wrote the songs for his ninth album, Weather Vanes, recorded with his band, The 400 Unit. The sound is hard and soft, always showcasing his intentional lyrics. That's where we started our conversation about the craft of songwriting. Jason, let's start with Weather Vanes, your latest collection of short stories. It, it was made during the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic. How did that shape it? I was working on a movie. I was out in Oklahoma for about three months close to it. And I started, I wrote most of these songs while I was there because I didn't have a timeline really for a new record. You know, the situation was when we weren't filming, we weren't going out and hanging just because nobody wanted to get COVID, you know. Um, so I spent a lot of time in like a, a, a rented house in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, or in the trailer, you know, in, in hair and makeup waiting. Because Oklahoma, if you go too long, you get into storm season. And, uh, and we wound up a lot of days just sitting in the trailer. So I had a guitar with me and started writing a lot of these songs. Describe your experience during the pandemic, because we've all, we all went through it. Yeah. We all have these cul-de-sacs in our lives, these mm -hmm. little knots on our trees. What was the pandemic, what does it mean for you, that period of time? I remember waking up a few months into it and thinking about uh, the recovery process because I'm a recovered alcoholic and, and I work on that constantly, you know, and that whole one day at a time thing that they sell you, that really came in handy when every day was practically identical to the day before it, you know, so I remember being really grateful for that. You said it reminded you of when you used to play in your bedroom mm -hmm. at home. What does that feel like when it reminds you? I think probably meditative, you know. Uh, you do get lost in it. And, um, you know, even when I would sit down and start to write a song, you know, I have to be careful because if I, if I use a guitar that sounds too much like uh, Jimmy Page and I'm trying to write a song, then I'll just play Jimmy Page riffs for two or three hours and not write anything, you know. Uh, but that's, I think that's very good for your brain, too. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's the sort of thing that kind of, and it's the thing that I've never had to be told to do. My parents never said you need to go practice. Nobody ever said you need to go to guitar lessons. You need to do, you know. It was just if, if there was nothing else I had to be doing, I was playing the guitar. Is that a way to describe when it's going right for you in songwriting, that it feels like me? Is that a way to know you're there? Yeah, I think so. You know, but after doing it for this long, it's all, I'm, I start there, you know. Here we go from the tippy, roll it, baby. We've been testing you. The thing about songwriting is, is, you know, you can spend so much time, there's only so many notes, but there's a whole lot of words. With lyrics, you can go forever. Which can be a problem. Oh yeah, yeah, big problem, yeah. Explain that problem. Well, if you start off with a direction, uh, a purpose, a story, at the beginning of a song, if there's something that you want to say, so you need to write a song about that, uh, to me that is far more difficult and usually less rewarding than just creating characters and following them around. And get surprised. Yes, you should. Yeah, that's when it feels like a success. That's when I think, you know, okay, I started from me. I started from something that was personal to me, but I found out something along the way. That's, that's when you've done it right. Give me an example, is there a, of that kernel you start with? That image or that line or that thing? Is there one from a, from a song on this album or something else where, yeah, it's that, that initial spark? Yeah, I mean, uh, Cast Iron Skillet, that song is an obvious example of that. Don't wash the cast iron skillet. Usually, uh, if I can find one really good detail, then you can anchor people to wherever you want them to go. You know, and when you, the, the, the connotations of a cast iron skillet are 
you know, it's not it's not just something that's specific to Southern American culture, but if you can start writing about food, you can go in all kinds of directions. People spend most of their time in the kitchen serving your family, you know, taking care of somebody else. Um, you know, love is in food. There's all of this, and there's also poison. Uh, but yeah, the skillet, you know, once once I'm there, I think, well, I know what kind of story this should be. I don't know what the story should be yet. The old man at the quick stop, lying to the county cops. And, and then I just start opening myself up emotionally to what does this remind me of? How does this make me feel? And the, the more I can open my mind up, the more details I get. It's hard to go through life without your daddy by your side. I want to hold on to cast iron skillet for a second. It's not just the skillet, it's the, it's the lesson about the way you're supposed to treat a skillet. Yes. And the lessons of growing up in the South. It, that song, like a lot of the, like the whole album, there's a tension in that song. Explain the tension as you were writing Cast Iron Skillet. I think really by the end of that song, I don't know that I was trying this at the beginning. At the beginning I was just trying to tell some good, coherent stories. But by the end of the song, uh, I was trying to say something about um, you know, how we picture the South versus the reality of it, you know. Um, and that's kind of my favorite way to tell a story uh, is, is, you know, let's take um, what's commonly accepted as the truth about this place because it's easy and it's romantic and it's nostalgic and let's kind of dig in a little bit and see what it's really like. I love it when stories do that. Why is that important for stories to do that? Um, well, because that's the only way you're going to actually empathize with anybody, you know, is to get to the reality of it. And I think storytellers should be obsessed with truth before anything else, you know. And, and that, that puts you at odds with entertainment sometimes, because sometimes entertainment is the opposite. It's the escapism from the truth. But that's the difference between something that's the song of the summer and something that's a song they play at your funeral. Yeah, right, right. Although, I mean, people should have the song of the summer playing at their funeral more often. <laughs> Funerals are so sad. I mean, and really, like, the person who died is not there. You might as well put something good on the radio. I, I want to ask you about another line from Middle of the Morning, which feels both a little bit of the pandemic and also about your, your life in general. There's a line in there where you say, where, sorry, the narrator says, and you tell me if it's you, uh, I'm trying to be grateful for my devils. Yes, I try to be grateful for my devils. So I look back on the time when I was uh, addicted, when I was drinking too much, taking drugs, making bad decisions. And for a while there, um, I was regretful about the whole process, all of it, you know. And then I got around to being um, regretful about the specific things that I should regret, but being grateful for the experience as a whole, you know. And that was huge for me because that took time. You know, it's hard to look back. If you're, if you're new in recovery, uh, it was tough for me to look back at that guy and say, well, all that actually kind of turned out for the best, you know, because it's dangerous. You don't want to go back there. But after a few years, it, it occurred to me that I just would not be the person that I am now unless I'd gone through all that, even though I put myself through it. You know, I still learned a lot from it. Things that I need now and I really needed in the pandemic. I really needed to be able to sit alone with myself in the moment in the pandemic. That, that saved me more than anything else. And I don't know that I would have gotten to that point if I'd never been an alcoholic. Do you ever think of yourself as trying to help people sit along with themselves in the moment? I don't, but I think that's a valiant thing to try, you know. But I guess... I haven't before, but I think that's a good way, that's a good way to put it. And a lot of people's problems would be, would be solved yeah. if they could do that, you yeah. know. You wouldn't wind up with bad relationship partners, you wouldn't be so angry with everybody that you care about, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have so many tensions with your neighbors if you could just sit there by yourself and be okay with yourself. And what does it feel like when somebody comes to you and says, I don't know you, but you know me? That's a huge success as a songwriter because to get there, you have to put things in the song that you might question either because you're uncomfortable with them, because they don't paint you in the best light, or because you think they're too specific. Mm -hmm. And this is something that really 
I think for young songwriters, you know, the the uh, the temptation is to be broad and vague, and you know, say things that you think might relate to everybody, you know. Uh, but if you get really specific and you put the the tiny little weird stuff in there, that's when you hear from people, "How do you know this about my life?" And to me, that's that's how you make a really strong connection with somebody in your audience. What does it mean to serve the song? Well, you've got to you got to get get rid of your ego to serve the song. You gotta quit trying to impress people, whether it's with your lyrics or, or your melody or your production or uh, your musicianship. You know, you gotta say, okay, I have a story to tell. How am I gonna tell that story in the best possible way and let everything else go? Nothing to prove, you know. Welcome back. When you write songs for a living, how does it shape your observations? Isbell explains how it builds a sense of gratitude. He refers in this section of our conversation to his song, Save the World, exploring his fear of school shootings, which he describes from the perspective of a parent. How many songs are, would you say you are working on right now? Three, maybe? Yeah, maybe three, usually three at a time, four at a time. What's the longest you've ever worked on a song? Carried around a line for years and then finally oh, gelled? 20, 25 years. You know, a uh, cast iron skillet was one of those. I, I carried around a concept for that. I tried to write like the first half of that song um, is about a couple kids that I grew up with in Alabama who wound up murdering somebody. And I tried to write that from the time I was 20, 21 years old until last year. Um, uh, just because it was such a delicate topic, you know, and, and, and there are clear victims, you know, mm. and then at another level, everybody in town was a victim, including the perpetrator. You know, you, you can be both at the same time. So it took me a long time to handle that uh, in a way that I felt was appropriate. This is going to sound like a weird question. Good. How do you listen? Um, it depends on what I'm listening to, you know, because I'm not going to be unfair. If I'm if I'm listening to uh, Dua Lipa, I'm listening to melody and rhythm, you know. And then after I get past that, I'll dig into the lyrics. And normally I like it, you know. I like Dua Lipa, you know. If I'm listening to Robin, I'll listen to lyrics first, you know. Even though it's pop music and there's not all that much difference, because I know those are going to be great. If I'm listening to uh, uh, Nick Drake, you know, I'm listening to lyrics and melody almost the whole time, you know, but if I'm listening to, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, T-Bone Walker, I'm listening to the guitar first, you know. And, and if I don't know, if I'm wading into something I have no idea, uh, I just listen to all of it and then immediately my brain tries to find the part that's most important. When you're not listening to music, have you changed the way you listen for lyrics that you're going to write? The way you interact with the world, how do you listen? At first you think, I need a song, you know, I need songs, I, I gotta make another record at some point, I need, so you start looking, you know, and then after a while you figure out, oh, this is serving more than just work, you know, this is, this is making me a happier person. Um, because there is no end to the things you can be grateful for. Now for a lot of people there's no end to mm -hmm. suffering. But there's all the beautiful things are still there. You know, you might not have access to them, um, but if you do, you should you should itemize them and 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 make sure you notice as much as humanly possible. So is songwriting an act of gratitude for you? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, yeah. Um, because it's about being aware, noticing things that other people don't notice. That's the real trick. And when you do that, you become grateful for those things automatically. Do you ever aim your songwriting at problems you can't solve? Um, yes, yeah, I do. Uh, but, but that's when I go the most personal with the story. Like on uh, Save the World, that song on Weather Vanes. The most important rule on that song was to mind the perspective. 
pay very close attention to how this story is being told. Who is telling the story? You know, because anything else, you're undermining the strength of the narrative and the message itself. You know, so I'm not going to go. If I was 17, 18 years old, yeah, I might write a song from the perspective of someone who was in a school shooting. You know, but I am not 17 or 18 years old. So I think, well, I have to, I have to talk about this from my perspective. How does this affect me? How does this make me feel? Even if I'm building a character, the only way to really get in there is to take it from your own true, honest place in the story. And, uh, you know, I am afraid. I'm afraid of going into public, taking my child into public, mm -hmm. you know, living in uh, American society. I'm afraid because there are too many guns. There are too many people with those guns. To tell that story and to get that point across, I can't fix that, you know, I can't. But I can tell somebody, hey, that way that you're feeling, I feel that way too, right. you know. So we're not solving the problem we set out to solve, but we're solving a problem. And in terms of your personal, I think it was For Ian Forster who said, how do I know what I think till I see what I've said? Mm -hmm. Is there a songwriting version of that? Where that, that, that's the way you process things, so. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the document, yeah, you yeah. make the document. It's like journaling, you know? Yeah. It's like when I was a kid, my parents would fight, my mom would write letters and never give them to anybody. I'm a white man living in a white man's world. What does it mean to write political songs? Mm. And what are the different ways that you understand that idea? If you're living in a place where you don't have clean water and you're going up to your neighbors and your leaders and everybody all day talking about how much you need clean water, nobody's going to say, why are you going to talk about politics? You know, but if you have clean water and you're doing that, everybody says, why, why are you always talking about politics? You know, well, it's not just politics because my water's clean. It's not, it's not not politics because their water's not clean. These things are personal to a lot of people. But the reality of it is, I think, to call it political, um, you know, uh, um, from the perspective of a music critic or a fan or something, I think that diminishes the fact that, you know, it's personal to somebody. There's no such thing someone else's war. Does a song that says, screw the government, is that the same as a song that says, I'm scared, but they're just two different approaches to the same issue? Yeah, two different approaches that, I mean, to me, really probably uh, deal with maturity as a storyteller, yeah. you know? Explain so, what you mean. So if you go past the secondary emotions or the tertiary emotions and you get down to what you really feel, you know, screw the government means I'm afraid of the government. You know, wow, you just said something. You just you just edited yourself there. Once you stop saying, screw the government, and start saying, I'm afraid of the government, you just made a great editing choice because now you're being honest with yourself. A couple more lines, you'll be being honest with everybody else, you know. And Why are honest, you afraid? The more honest you are with yourself. The more that window opens up into everybody else and they start thinking you know a secret about them, you know. And the more, to, to me, that's the challenge. And And... If you're trying to be as popular as possible or sell as many records as possible, that's not your job. Your job is not to find this window into people's innermost soul. Um, but uh, if, if you want to write the best songs you can possibly write, then you're, you're going to have to actually reach out and, and be very specific and very clear and very open with your own emotions. And saying, you know, screw the government, they, 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 don't, they don't care about us, they're just trying to control us, I mean, maybe, you know, but, but why? Just keep asking why until you run out of whys, until you have a why, and you can't ask that question again. And write that line down, you know. Why do they want to control us? Why do you feel that way? Why are you dissatisfied, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then eventually you're writing about real personal feelings. And then people go, oh, you know a secret about me. Welcome back to our interview with Jason Isbell. In the spring of 2023, country artist Jason Aldean released a song called Try That in a Small Town. He said it was about getting back to a sense of community, but critics said it was an undisguised celebration of vigilante violence. Isbell also comes from a small southern town, and I asked him about that heritage. We start with his 2017 song, Something to Love. 
Give me your understanding of the song, Something to Love. I was writing a song to my daughter specifically. Um, and I don't think the song itself is nostalgic, but I, I, I use nostalgia intentionally um, uh, to get to the place where I could relate to her um, how important it is to um, search until you locate an action that will keep you satisfied with your life. I hope you find something to love, something to do when you feel like giving up. The song describes what I understand was your upbringing playing music with your grandfather, mm -hmm. and that's in that song. Yeah, yeah. Is that your something to love, playing music? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, first line of the second stanza is about being in a small town. I was born in a tiny southern town. And in your new album, there's some complexity about that small town piece. I, I guess what intrigued me was this crucial lesson you're, you're offering to your daughter comes out of what you said might be nostalgia, but comes out of your small town upbringing. For sure, yeah. yeah. And there, that was, to me, the most beautiful part of that. I mean, we were all, you know, close uh, in proximity and uh, emotionally, you know, we were all close to yeah. each other. I knew my grandparents, I spent all kinds of time with them. Um, you know, there were complications to that too. Uh, um, but yeah, it's, I hold all those things in my mind at the same time. I'm still singing like that green speckled bird. There's a political discussion around try that in a small town. Right. From Jason L.D. What do you make of his description of small towns? He doesn't say much, well, it's not his description, it's the songwriters, but uh, it doesn't say much about small towns at all. It, 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 it speaks about um, things that people are afraid of happening in big cities. That's what the song's about. You know, most of the things in that song that they're upset about uh, are legal, you know. And so if they all get together and come get you and, and beat you up or, you know, cussing at a police officer, uh, they're the ones that have broken the law. They have assaulted you. <laughs> They've attacked you. So basically in that line, he's saying, we will, me and my friends will assault you if we disagree with you. Come to our small town and get assaulted uh, for not agreeing with us. Um, you know, bigger than that, it's just riling people up. You spend some time on Twitter, and I wonder if you worry about you and or the audience for your message getting distracted. No, no. No, I don't think about that. That's external stuff. So the way I grew up in my small town, you know, when I was really little, we were in a trailer in my grandmother's yard. My uncle was behind the house, and we were next to the house. And uh, um, my granddad, my uncle, and my dad had built their house themselves there. We didn't have a lot. I mean, we had, you know, clearly I had enough to eat, but we didn't have a whole lot of extras. Um, now I have a lot of extras, and my life is very easy. If I did not make my feelings known publicly, I would have a hard time being okay with that. Hmm. It's very easy for me to think I have too much. I have more than my share. Um, so part of that is I have to say these things out loud. I have to tell people. I can't just let them believe that I'm okay with wrong yeah. things. Because if so, then I'm going to be miserable with all this stuff. So your vulnerability makes you feel more at peace with your comfort? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, isn't that the point? Like, shouldn't that be what you do? As your life gets easier, shouldn't you look around and go, well, their life's still not easy. At the very least, I'm going to say something about it. You know, I might not be able to fix it, but hey, everybody, look over there. They're not having a good time. I'm not ambitious in the sense that I want to be more famous. Um, you know, I don't need to, to sell out. Uh, stadiums and be the biggest, I don't care. You know, you, you, as long as you can get a good table at the restaurant, everything after that is just a pain in the ass. Um, you know, in reality. Joan Didion? I think it was Joan Didion, <laughs> yeah. <was> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she said, she Jason said. Jason Isbell's version of Joan Didion. Yeah, she, what she said was you want to get, uh, you want to be famous enough to get the table, but not so famous to get bothered while you're eating. That right. was the Didion, yeah. Welcome back. 
We move our interview to the couch now to hear Jason Isbell play a track from his new album. But first, a little background on two songs we discuss. King of Oklahoma, from his latest release, tells the story of a man who has hit bottom while struggling with opioid addiction. And Cover Me Up, written 10 years ago, is influenced by Isbell's personal story. Young fame, hard living, and finding love and sobriety with his singer-songwriter wife, Amanda Shires. But we start talking about his favorite guitar, the legendary 1959 Gibson Les Paul Red Eye. Now explain to me the heart of what it means to own a 1959 Les Paul. Oh, you know that, I'm going to tell you the truth. Owning that guitar means more to me than the Grammys or any of that stuff. Why? You know? um, because I don't go pick up the Grammys and play Led Zeppelin riffs on them uh, every couple days. I think the thing about a, a, a highly collectible instrument like that, you know, it serves as an incidental work of art. It wasn't meant to be a work of art. It was craft. People were working nine to five making these things. The accidents that happened, you know, what they were trying to do versus what people did with those instruments is the significance to me. I call it the Wurlitzer effect because when you hear a Wurlitzer electric piano, it's hard to even picture that they were trying to sound like a grand piano. Like it sounds nothing like a grand piano, but you know, Ray Charles without a Wurlitzer or a Rhodes, it just wouldn't be the same mm -hmm. because they did things with the, the accidents that made them even more beautiful than their original design. When you pick up a guitar to play, is there always a first either chord you play or song you play that you've been playing since you are in that bedroom? I think there's, there's this like um, Chet Atkins arrangement of a song. Uh, <laughs> that I learned when I was a kid called the Bells of St. Mary's that I play probably more often than anything else. I don't know why, I just like that melody. You don't pick with your index finger? Um, not really. Is no. that a, is that because you're self-taught or is that? Yeah, it's all because I'm self-taught, yeah. I'm supposed to be using these, you know, but I don't use them much. I'm happy to be here. In the documentary, the HBO documentary running with our eyes closed, we see in your process. And there are those scenes where you come in to the band and play them songs for the first time. Took forever to get you to trust me. And you have, in some part of the rewrite process, run them by Amanda Shires, your wife, mm -hmm. who's a virtuoso, either violin or fiddle player, depending on the... Yeah. What's the difference between a violin she and says, a fiddle? She says it's a, it's a fiddle when you're buying it, it's a violin when you're selling it. That's what she says. I don't think I'll be able to think about this right now until we've discussed. I'll send you a text. And obviously that documentary is very raw. Mm -hmm. It goes back to that point about vulnerability you were, you were talking about. It's quite raw. Is she still a part of your songwriting process? She is, yeah. It's different now, though. I mean, we're not going to, you know, have difficulty and then not change anything, you know. Um, so after the, after the documentary, after all that happened, we changed the way we work a little bit. Now, I still, I still go to her, you know, and play the songs for her. Uh, and she does that with me too. Like she's in the studio right now working on a record and, and she'll send me stuff. She sent me a song last night, you know. And I said, I like it, but I don't love this line. You know, I've seen this a lot lately, you know, meaning that this is a cliche or that, you know, it's about to be. So we still bounce the ideas off of each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How does that go though for either one of you? I mean, so do, does she give you a note and do you immediately say, hmm, let me sit with that, or you go, no, that, I disagree, and then after about a day you go, no, maybe she was right. Yeah, usually if, like, we'll know. Like, I'll know she's going to say something about this line, you know, because we've done it that many times. Yeah. And I think I need, I need to either have a defense prepared or be willing to try something different, you know. It's a waste of time, I think, to sit and think on it, um, you know, because you know immediately if it's right or not. If, if she says that's not right, you know, most of the time she's, she's correct, it's not. Yeah. But sometimes I'm like, no, 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 because here's what I'm doing. And right. it's like, oh, okay, never mind. So it's like either you can defend it in the moment 
or you need to go work on changing it. Southeastern came out 10 years ago. It was such a part of a turning point in your life after you got sober. How, does, how do you experience it now, 10 years later, singing so powerfully songs about a very specific time in your life? You know, for the most part, it feels like I'm trying to hit those notes, <laughs> and that's where my focus is. Right. Uh, uh, totally in the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's one thing I just love about live performance is, is that focus. It's, it's like two hours of trying your absolute hardest at something, which at 44 years old, you know, who does that? Who does that a hundred times a year, spend two hours, you know, trying your absolute heart, your best, 100% your best. Cover me up and know you're not. I think maybe the first time I heard Cover Me Up was when it was played as someone's wedding song. Mm -hmm. It was their wedding song. Mm -hmm. A, how does something like that make you feel? And B, are songs like children, you, you, they go out into the world and what they become and what people make of them is not under your control. Face to the test. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm not going to tell people that's not a good wedding song, you know, um, because I don't want to ruin their experience with it. That's 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 part of the process of of performing a song and releasing a song into the world. You know, um, there's a reason they call it a, a release, a record release. <laughs> you know, because it's it's out. You open the gate and go. Um, but um, you know, it also, I think it makes me prouder of a song when someone misinterprets it. Explain what that means. When, so, when I write something that's about one thing and somebody else thinks it's about something completely different and loves it for that reason, yeah. then I, it makes me feel better about the song because I think, oh, okay, all right, well, this was available to them for what they needed also. And when they came in with their own baggage, you know, this song made sense in a different way to them than it did to me. So the, the song itself is stronger if it's open to misinterpretation. You've left them room to inhabit the song themselves. Yeah, yeah, which is, is a tough line to walk when you're being that specific and that honest with your audience, you know. Like when, when I get to the part about, uh, you know, swearing off alcohol and everybody raises up their glass. Oh, but I sobered up and I swore off that stuff. Forever this time. You know, I don't see that as ironic at all. I don't. I don't think that's that. That's not weird. That makes me feel great. Mm -hmm. You know, because some part of that message got in there. And out of all those people raising up their glass, there's probably a couple of them that don't need to have that glass in their hand at that point. And there may be one day when that's part of the 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 uh, you know straws that break that particular camel's back. You know. They may listen to that song enough, and also there may be an intervention and a yeah. thousand other things that make them go, eh, maybe I should quit. You know? She used to make me feel like the king of Oklahoma. How weird would it be for me to say that part of Kings of Oklahoma is a love song? Oh, not weird at all. The whole thing is a love song. It is a love I was, song. I was going to say it, but it's I didn't want It's a love wanna... song. Yeah, no, it is definitely a love song. Going back to big speed, tired of trying to fix me. Says I got some things to figure out. And it's about one of the many ways a relationship can fall apart, you know. Um, uh, one of the more brutal ways, I think. I won't ruin you. I won't ruin that song by giving you my interpretation, but it's... a beautifully crafted song. Thank you. It's uh, the last line. Mm -hmm. That'll get you. Yeah. Nothing makes me feel like much of nothing anymore. When Reunions came out, you were in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You had that weird, you know, it was bizarre. Bizarre. Yeah. But now you're, you're out there again. You're yeah. on stage. Does it feel extra because of the period when you were oh, not definitely. able to be on a stage? Most definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the audiences are, are more responsive than they were before the pandemic. You know, I've said this a couple times before, but like Wednesday nights now feel like Friday nights used to feel, you know. Once you understand what the communal experience of a concert can do for you, you don't stop thinking about it. Nobody just goes to one rock show, you know. <laughs> it's always like, man, I need to do that again. That was really good for me. I saw a picture of you and Grace Bowers, maybe from Newport. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. What would you tell somebody, given that you were 
real young when you started going on tour. What would you tell them about the future of, of being a rock and roll star? Oh, I'm not, I wouldn't tell her anything. I don't think she needs any advice from me. She's 17, I should let yeah, people know. She's 17. She started, you know, she's, she's a she's, great guitar player. Um, and seems to like, you know, have her priorities all in the right order. Um, honestly, man, I don't know. That's tough. It's like, I just don't really have any advice. You know, I think make, I think make, make, make the music that makes you the happiest, you know, no matter what external sources are telling you, no matter what the label says or your, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, publisher says, uh, just, just write songs and play songs and sing songs that you enjoy. Um, because either way, you know, if you do something that you don't love and it becomes successful and you get known for that, you're gonna have to do it forever, and and uh, I know a bunch of people that's happened to, and they're stuck making this music that they don't like, but it pays the bill, so they have to be grateful for it, you know. What song off a new album is making you the happiest to play right now? That's a good question. Uh, I love playing King of Oklahoma because it's so huge, and we take a long time on the outro, the extended outro, and kind of play it like Crazy Horse or something, you know. Yeah. But I love playing Cast Iron Skillet because it's a good moment to just drop yeah. the bottom out, you know, and play really quietly. And people love that song, especially people from the South. They just, mm. they, they love the fact that that song deals with, you know, an honest look at some of those old ways. Would you play one of those? Yeah. Or, or Strawberry Woman or anything else you yeah, want to play? Yeah, I'll, I'll play it. Don't wash the cast iron skillet Don't drink and drive your spilling Don't ask too many questions Or you'll never get to sleep There's a hole inside you Fill it Shower up and shave Put flowers on the grave And ask the Lord to save his soul Was it 27 times or was it 29? I heard the blade broke off inside the man and he took a while to die. How did you get so low? It seems like just a week ago we were 10 and 12 years old. He was sweet and soft. He shied away from the inside fastballs and died doing life without parole. Don't wash the cast iron skillet. That dog bites my kid, I'll kill it. Don't walk where you can't see your feet. Don't ask questions, just believe. Jamie found a boyfriend with smiling eyes and dark skin and her daddy never spoke another word to her again. The old man at the quick stop lying to the county cops and laughing like his soul was without a sin. Tell me how'd you get so low? It seems like just a week ago she was sitting Watching fireworks in the sky He treats her like a queen But you don't know Cause you ain't seen It's hard to go through life Without your daddy by your side Don't wash the cast iron skillet This town won't get no better Will it? She found love and it was Simple as a weather vane, but her own family tried to kill it. Don't wash the cast iron skillet. Don't wash the cast iron skillet. Don't wash the cast iron.
Thank you. Thank you. It's a real honor, Thank you, John. Thank really. you. I really appreciate it. I love talking to you. Thank you for joining us for the hour. It was our pleasure to put this together with you in mind, and we'll hope you join us for the next one. For CBS News Primetime, I'm John Dickerson.